There's a bombshell paper out today, December 14th, 2021. This is Nature Medicine, and the paper is entitled Risks of Myocarditis, Pericarditis, and Cardiac Arrhythmias Associated with COVID-19 Vaccination or SARS-CoV-2 Infection. And this is by investigators at Oxford in Nature Medicine, the United Kingdom. Very important study here. The authors use a broad population-based data set to finally give us a comparison between risks of myocarditis after vaccination, whether dose one of the Pfizer vaccine, dose one, dose two of the Moderna vaccine, and the uh, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, we can just say right off the bat, the adenoviral vector vaccines have not been implicated with excess myocarditis. They've been implicated with VIT, which is less frequent, but perhaps more morbid. That's vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis. That's a different problem. We'll talk about that some other time or in a different video. Let's talk about myocarditis. This is a population-based assessment comparing the rates of myocarditis, and I'm just going to show you the most important figure. I'm going to put it up right here, right here on the screen. You got to take a look at that. This is a comparison of the rates of myocarditis adjusted for the population after dose one, dose two of Pfizer, dose one, dose two of Moderna in under 40-year-old people compared against the risk of myocarditis after getting infected with SARS-CoV-2. And as you can see, dose two of Moderna has exceeded the risk of myocarditis after infection with a second dose. This is an important piece of information. I think there's been many people who have been reluctant to take serious the risks of myocarditis after the Moderna product, in part because they always say, well, it's more risky to get SARS-CoV-2. You're much more likely to have myocarditis. These data show conclusively that is not the case. If you're under 40, and if you pool men and women together, it is more myocarditis associated with dose two of Moderna than it is with an infection. That is a bombshell finding that should put on the head the opinions of many people. But this is even... This figure here I'm going to show again. This doesn't even show you the full picture. The authors have not separated men and women. If you were to separate men and women, you'll see the risk is much higher in men. It's much lower in women. If you average those two, it's going to be more in the middle. And that's what you're seeing here in the figure, something in the middle. But if you pulled out men under 40, it's going to be more pronounced. It's also going to be more pronounced if you looked at infection in a different way. Now, in this Nature Medicine paper, they're looking in the charts to see who has a documented SARS-CoV-2 positive test. Now, as we all know, many people who had this infection have a documented SARS-CoV-2 test. But many people who had this infection don't have a documented SARS-CoV-2 test. They may not have had much symptoms. They may not have sought the test. Some of them had it. They recovered on their, in their house. They didn't go seek care. They didn't get a test. And so what that means is the denominator of people who had a SARS-CoV-2 infection, the numerator of people, the people who had an infection who had myocarditis, that numerator, they have to seek medical care. That's probably going to be very similar to the numerator in this paper. But the denominator is going to be much bigger than the denominator of this paper. And that will mean that the rate will be a little bit lower in that final bar. So if you were to look at the risk to a 24-year-old man from dose 2 Moderna versus the risk for the same 24-year-old man if he were to get SARS-CoV-2 using a zero prevalence as a denominator, I suspect this difference that you see in this figure here will be even more pronounced. It will be a massive difference, a massive difference suggesting the risk from dose two of Moderna is in excess of the risk of myocarditis after vaccination. What does this mean? There are immediate ways we can mitigate this. I mean, a number of European nations have already recognized that this is something that doesn't just happen to anybody. It happens to a subgroup of people who are particularly vulnerable. Those are men under the age of 30 or 40. We can simply follow the footsteps of other nations like Germany and Denmark and say, if you're a man under the age of 40, we're not going to recommend the Moderna product anymore. We're going to recommend Pfizer. Pfizer offers nearly the same benefit in vaccine efficacy with much lower rates of myocarditis as you see in that figure. So why wouldn't you offer the safer alternative? We have tons of vaccine supply. We don't have to be wedded to using Moderna, certainly at this point in the pandemic. Next, I think it has implications for boosters. You're going to have to actually do some hard work in thinking around the boosters dilemma. I think people like Paul Offit, people like Gruber and Krauss, they have argued that maybe we don't know everything we need to know about the mass campaign to boost everybody 16 and up, every healthy person, maybe men 16 to 30. We need to think differently about booster strategies. We need more data here. What are the benefits and harms of the third dose in this age group? What's the rate of myocarditis? We don't yet know. This is, of course, all dose one, dose two from the UK authors. This is a very important paper. I think 
It clearly dispels a popular rumor that people were saying. I don't know why they ever said it, because I wouldn't have said it, because certainly there was no evidence to suggest that it was true for sure. They were saying that it's not possible that vaccination would have a higher rate of myocarditis than the illness itself. This shows clearly that under some circumstances, for under 40, all comers, second dose Moderna, it does. That's what that figure showed you. It would be more pronounced if you looked at 16 to 24 year old men because they have the absolute highest risk of myocarditis. It would be more pronounced if you actually corrected the denominator for infection to reflect all the people who were sick and some of whom stayed in their house. And to do that, you need sort of a random sampling seroprevalence study of a nation. They have that in the UK. I actually requested that the authors perform such a study and such analysis, or at least to provide some correction coefficients to their, to their rate. This is a bombshell paper. It's very important. It is a very important time we face in, in vaccine science, which is that science has and policy has to always try to get it right. And getting it right means that sometimes you have to appreciate nuance. There are no rock solid absolute positions. Sometimes the right thing is to experiment with different dosing strategies, time between doses, to prefer some products over others, to refine your strategy. Repeating the same thing in the face of new evidence, that is not scientific, it's rather crazy. And to do so because you believe a simple message should override all other considerations, including safety, I think is irrational. So I think we need to learn from our European colleagues. This is an important paper from Europe. We need to take these lessons and bring it to the United States. I also think discussion online on vaccine issues is so polarized. There are very strong opinions that often lack robust evidence on both sides of the issue. The truth is you need somebody to come into this middle space and actually use evidence, evidence-based appraisal, who understands numbers, who has numeracy, to try to tease apart how much benefit do we get and what are the downsides with different strategies. And as I said in a prior video, if you start to ask the question, which is worse, the vaccine or the disease, you're already on the wrong foot. Vaccination is supposed to be much, much safer than disease. That's, that's the starting point, okay? Once we accept that vaccination is the path to durable immunity or to immunity, perhaps natural infection has more durability, but once we accept that vaccination is the path by which we're gonna achieve some amount of immunity, we need to try to mitigate the harms of the intervention. We need to have the safest vaccination strategy. So if you have two vaccination strategies and one is safer than the other, if preferring Pfizer is safer than Moderna, why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you wanna make the safe choice here? So this paper, I think, should dispel a talking point that was said by people who I don't think have a lot of sophistication with data analysis and certainly with risk and rates in this time in this space. And this is a space of, you know, one in 2000 to one in 2020 to 30,000. That's a space that I think it takes a certain amount of sophistication to think about rates in that space. You have a lot of commenters who feel very strongly about this issue who don't spend their time in this sandbox. And if you don't, you will get it wrong. So what do I think about this paper? I commend the authors. It's courageous to publish this paper. I'm certain that they are going to take heat in some quarters. I also think it's really important. It's really important that we get the safety equation correct. And many of us have been on this subject for many months. I remember in the spring of 2020 when I started to read the newspaper reports out of Israel in the Jerusalem Times about the rates of myocarditis that they had identified. I knew Israel had a very good surveillance system. I know Israeli scientists are top-notch. I trusted those reports. They led to an EMA investigation in May. They led to the United States actions in June. The last thing I wanna say, while the denominator of myocarditis uh, after infection, that denominator, the number of people who are infected, is likely underestimated in this, which makes the rate higher, and if you corrected that, that rate would be lower, the numerator of myocarditis after vaccination might be depressed a little bit. This relies on a passive surveillance system. Somebody has to report this to central authorities. Um, that is always going to diminish to some degree the actual cases. There'll be some cases that are missed. And in fact, the authors of this paper acknowledge that as a limitation of their paper. So this is all the more reason to take this very seriously and to think about ways to mitigate this. I do not understand why in the presence of alternatives, we are not following the lead of Germany and Denmark. I think that's a misstep by the CDC. It wouldn't be their first misstep, probably not gonna be their last misstep, but it is a misstep. It's not too late to correct the ship. They can reorient they can think about better strategies, safer strategies for vaccination, particularly for the most vulnerable age group, which is boys 12 to 24, 12 to 30, and to some degree 12 to 40. Um, once, we, once we mitigate that risk, 
um, I think we will have a much safer strategy. And I don't think anyone wants to use a suboptimal strategy. We can use the best strategy. So this paper, what they could have done better is they could have disambiguated men and women under 40. They could have broken down age a little bit more. They could have corrected for serial prevalence with that denominator. But other than that, I think it's a solid paper and I still commend them for publishing it. That figure alone that I showed you, that's gonna be a provocative figure. That's gonna be a figure that may actually get some people who are solidified in their thinking or views to reconsider this issue. So those are my thoughts. Risk of myocarditis, pericarditis, cardiac arrhythmia is associated with COVID-19 vaccination or SARS-CoV-2 infection. The important figure, check it out, read the paper. If you like this, you know what to do. This is what you get on this channel. Policy analysis from someone who's been in this business for a long time. Evidence-based appraisal, my favorite thing on earth. So you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below, hit that bell. Until next time.